On this episode of Women Behind Bars, one woman is convicted of killing a devoted friend. Jackie pulls out a knife. And she actually started stabbing Thomas with it. It was just in and out, in and out, constantly stabbing Thomas. He was crawling towards me, and he was saying, Jackie, I love you. Then, Heather Frango pled guilty to involuntary manslaughter when a pit bull mauled her two-year-old son to death. His ears were removed, his scalp was removed. He had over 100 bite marks to his body. Two women, two brutal crimes. These are the stories of Jackie Alexander and Heather Frango. On June 14, 1998, police made a grisly discovery in a burned-out car near Lake Fisher in the close-knit community of Kannapolis, North Carolina. Inside the trunk lay the scorched, disfigured body of Thomas Hammond, a 41-year-old mill worker and neighborhood Good Samaritan. This murder was one of the most gory, the amount of violence that was inflicted upon the victim was the worst I saw in my 27 years. I just, just tore up and do nothing. Just couldn't believe it. The evidence led police to Hammond's roommate, 36-year-old Jackie Alexander, a former high school beauty queen with a history of violent outbursts. And 16-year-old Derek Wilkes, a close friend of Jackie's son. I was like, D I didn't do that. It was just like, it's in a horror movie that you didn't even invent and you're just trying to figure out how to get out of it. Was Jackie Alexander a calculating murderer, or did she succumb to an uncontrollable temper? Jackie Alexander, the eldest of five children, was born to Shirley Foggy, a single mother who was a maid and cotton picker for a southern white family. I don't know who my father is. Jackie's four siblings were fathered by three different men, one of whom her mother married. The guys my, my mom was going with would jump on her and uh, fight her, and I would try to help her, and a lot of times I got slapped around and, and beat on because of that. No matter how many men Jackie's mother had in her life, her love for her children always shone through. My mom and I was close. It's like I, I knew her thoughts before she said it, you know. I know she really, really did love her mama a, a whole lot. But from an early age, Jackie was painfully aware of her family's difficult circumstances. My childhood was like a kid in a grown body, and we were poor. I grew up in a neighborhood with, with a lot of uh, people drinking and a lot of fighting and cursing and a lot of violence. Sometimes people would get beat up. Sometimes people would get murdered. When Jackie was 11, her mother was hospitalized, but relatives never told her why. Then when they let us all go up in the hospital, I knew then that she was dying, and they still wouldn't tell us, so I was angry at them. The young teen's inner turmoil became a bigger problem for her, and she began a lifelong pattern of acting out her anger. That's when I started uh, really lashing out uh, in all bad ways, you might say. Um, with fighting in school. In the seventh grade, Jackie was failing her classes and was suspended for attacking a classmate. I was drinking water out of the water fountain at school. One of my classmates came up and he pushed my head on the water fountain. And um, when he did, I, I just turned around and I just, I just snapped. I had took that boy's head and rammed him into the water fountain and took the trash can and started beating him with the trash can when he got down and was kicking him and stuff. I got suspended for the rest of the year in the school. To make matters worse, her mother died of cancer. That's when everything went to pieces. I stopped caring about everything. Jackie and her four siblings moved in with their grandfather 
and his wife in Kannapolis, a southern textile mill town 25 miles north of Charlotte, North Carolina. Although Jackie was just a teenager, she was suddenly charged with the responsibility of caring for all of her siblings. I don't know, the instinct just kicked in. I just wanted to protect my brothers and sisters at any cost. Jackie said it was tough living with her strict grandfather and his disciplinarian wife. This is mostly the living arrangements. I was angry. I was taken out on them, being real abusive to them at times. She was known to be uh, a hell raiser, you know, and she had a bad temper. Harriet Ivy was a reporter at the Independent Tribune in Kannapolis. She grew up in the same community as Jackie. She was popular because of her beauty and her hell raising. Jackie's grandfather was also well known in the neighborhood. He sold alcohol in the dry town out of his house. My grandfather started me drinking at 12. And Jackie says her grandfather would often get drunk and physically abuse her and her siblings. He beat us with those leather straps that they used in the barbershop. When Jackie was 14, she found an escape from her problems at home on her high school track team. I don't think I ran it because I, I liked it. I could do it and then feel good because I got a lot of pressure off me. We were um, track mates together. She was wonderful. She was very fast. Whatever event that she ran, she ran it like she was in the Olympics. When I started winning, well, they seemed to say something good about it. We just was never told nothing good. We was always called names. Should have killed you when you were a baby. You know, those kind of things. We always heard stuff like that. We never heard nothing good. So I got more into the sports. After high school, she got pregnant at age 18 by her boyfriend. She gave birth to a baby girl she nicknamed Twink. She just looked like a twinkle, twinkle little star. It looked like a star. She just sparkled. <laughs> we was like how our mom and daughter supposed to be. That's my mama, that's my daughter. I'm there for her, she's there for me. Jackie never married Twink's father, but more than a year later, she married another man and had a son named Mark. The marriage lasted only a year and a half because according to Jackie, she was constantly beaten. She had a bad marriage, and I really do feel like that it took a toll on her, and it changed her. To vent her anger at being abused, Jackie continued her pattern of aggressive behavior. I had a lot of people that hated me. I was terrible. I had fought everybody practically in Kannapolis. But when Thomas Hammond, a well-respected handyman who lived in the same community, saw Jackie for the first time, he took an instant liking to her. Thomas was an all-around good-hearted, good-human country boy that cared about people. He didn't care who you was. He did a lot of uh, odds and ends jobs on the side, like fixing people, cars, and cabinets. He was well respected. Hammond, who was six years older than Jackie, was married with a family, but he left his wife to set up house with Jackie and her children. He always did treat us good, just like he my daddy. While living like brother and sister with Hammond, Jackie continued dating other men. It was a platonic relationship. Uh, it didn't appear to be any type of uh, sexual relationship. And this went on for several years. She didn't have nowhere to go. He cared that much about her and her kids to keep a roof over their heads. Wasn't no love. At first, when it started off, might have been, but it was just a just because case to me. Just because you ain't got nowhere to go, you can stay here. I don't think he loved her. But times were tough for this unemployed single mom. And to manage her frustrations, Jackie turned to crack. Crack would outweigh us. You know, and that's just not right. You got money, am I gonna buy crack or I'm gonna get my kids some food? I'm gonna go buy crack. Well, okay, what we supposed to do? Okay, fend for ourselves, and that's what we did. Jackie's drug addiction led to a life of crime that had her in and out of jail for almost 10 years. She was convicted of assaulting another woman with a razor blade. And then uh, after she got off probation for that offense, she was convicted of common law robbery. That was where she took a brick and uh, used it to smash over the head of a cabbie so that she could take that cabbie's money. While she did her time, Jackie's kids would stay with her roommate, Thomas Hammond, the one person who accepted her for who she was, or they stayed with relatives. I gave him a pretty bad example of a mother. Once, several times, they said all they wanted to do was spend time with me. So, you know, that, that hurts. 
As Jackie's life was spinning out of control, Thomas Hammond continued giving Jackie and her kids anything they needed. I can just remember just moving a lot, like just, we over this person's house, we over that person's house. Thomas always have been our rescue house. You know, like if, whenever we needed him, he was always there. We can be way in freaking Timbuktu, he on his way to come get us and my mom. He left his family on the other side of town to go be with her. So, you know, there had to be some strong emotion going on there. She loved him more like a friend, but he was obsessed with her, and it's a difference. I was using him at, in the beginning. I told him, and he, he was okay with it, and um, we eventually became, became good friends, and he became like part of the family. But Hammond's sisters felt that Jackie was a troubled woman who would only create chaos in Hammond's life. Anna Hammond said the two argued often, Yes, she hit him before I know of once. When my daddy died, he used to tell Tommy all the time, boy, that girl gonna kill you one day. When Women Behind Bars continues. Thomas knocked me on the floor, and when he did, there was some scissors on the dresser. So I grabbed the scissors, and I started stabbing him with the scissors. By 1998, 36-year-old Jackie Alexander had a long criminal history that included drug and assault convictions. She had been in and out of jail. She had divorced her husband and was raising two children when she met Thomas Hammond, a hardworking resident in the textile mill town of Kannapolis, North Carolina. While the relationship was supposedly platonic, Jackie had been living with Thomas Hammond on and off for more than 10 years. Thomas would make sure we had something to eat. He made sure we had clean clothes. So. It was like the safe house, basically. Hammond took care of Jackie and her teenage children. He also helped Jackie find jobs at local businesses. In the second week of June 1998, she was trying to straighten out her criminal record. I had so many charges on me. So I was in and out of court that week, and I was trying to not get no time, trying to let them work this out with me where I could pay. The job I worked on, you couldn't have a record. Just everything was building up. It's like I was with a struggle with good and evil at that point. Evil eventually won out. Jackie bought some crack from a local drug dealer and smoked it early in the day. I could always tell when my mama was back smoking crack or whatever it was she was doing. Yeah, I was just like, but mama, why you even want to go back? Well, you know, she just wanted to get herself right, I guess, for that day. At about 8 that evening, while her children were out, she asked Thomas to drive her to pick up her 15-year-old niece, Shauna. Her son's friend, Derek Wilkes, joined them. Derek was a troubled teen whose parents were divorced. He often hung around the house with Jackie and her kids. Derek was like my play son. He was my son's, one of his best friends, and Derek was at the house all the time, so he just fit right in. He respected me. I looked at her as, you know, a mother away from home. I mean, because. She, I mean, she just embraced me with open arms. But Hammond, who was like a father to Jackie's family, did not approve of Derek's crush on Shauna or Jackie's encouragement of it. Thomas, you know, had a problem with uh, me being over there so often. On the night of July 14th, 1998, Jackie and Derek both claimed they were hanging outside on the porch with Shauna. And Thomas had went in the house. We stayed outside. Uh, he was watching a movie. Thomas had just gone to bed when Jackie left the front porch and entered Thomas's bedroom to ask him to drive her niece home. He had gotten into bed, he wasn't asleep. He was like, tell Derek to take her home. You know, he got smart. According to Jackie, Thomas was angry that she had waited until such a late hour to ask him to drive. And Thomas made insulting remarks about Jackie's daughter and her niece. She says he said some things to her about this girl's gonna turn out just like your daughter. She's gonna be a whore and go out with drug dealers and older men. Uh, in other words, calling my daughter a whore. Jackie claims that when her protective instincts towards her family kicked in, she lost her temper and things got out of hand. I pushed him and when I pushed him really hard and I started hitting him and so Thomas knocked me on the floor. And when he did, there was some scissors on the dresser. So I grabbed the scissors and I started stabbing him with the scissors. I hollered for Derek to come and help. When I told her niece, I say, uh, I said, stay right here. When I came back in the living room, I mean, it's pissed off. And I'm watching Jackie. 
And she turned around at one point and looked at me. And when the jacket looked at me, I knew it wasn't jacket. You could just see it in her eyes. He was pinning her down back on the bed. She was still struggling, you know. He had raised his hand and one, he had, he was holding her down. I seen this arm come back and I thought he was gonna strike Jack. That's when I ran in the room and I grabbed Thomas. He was just charged it, man. And I grabbed him and we were just wrestling around. But by that time, Jackie had come running right back into the room and she had a big cast iron frying pan. And she handed it to me and she was like, hit him, Derek, hit him. Derek hit him in the head with the frying pan. And when he did, that's when I saw his eyes rolling in the back of his head. That's when he got up and stumbled. Thomas did as if he gonna go out the front door. And Derek went to stop him. And he hit him again with the frying pan. And that's when it broke. And um, Thomas fell out on the floor. He was crawling towards me. And he was saying, Jackie, I love you. And he asked Derek why. At that point, he tried to get up, and they hit him with a hammer. He passed out in the living room and was moaning and groaning. I mean, he was still here, but he's breathing. But at one point, you know, you could hear, I think, the blood gargling in his throat, you know. Jackie says she left the house with Shauna to get help, but could not find any. We went all over the whole neighborhood. It's always someone around. But this night, it wasn't nobody there, nobody home. But investigators say Jackie was really trying to find her niece a ride home so that she would not be implicated in the crime. Jackie then returned to the house to see if Hammond was alive or dead. At that point, she told Shauna to remain outside. When we got back, Derek was fussing and cussing at me. Why'd you leave me in here? The three-hour torture finally ended when Hammond was fatally stabbed with a knife. But Jackie and Derek gave different versions of who had the knife. Derek had took a kitchen knife and stabbed a knife through Thomas' neck, and he said, there, he's dead now. Nah, I never even stabbed Thomas. Jackie pulls out a knife, and she actually started stabbing Thomas with it. It was just in and out constantly, you know. She was stabbing Thomas. Derek said Jackie got two trash bags. The first one she had put over his head, it started filling up immediately with blood to the point where it fell off. She went and got another one and put that on top of that one and was choking him like that. No, no. I put that up on his head because he was bleeding. She held on to him, and his head just went limp in her lap. Yeah, he was dead then. I mean, because you could, his, his bowels let loose. I mean, you smell it. Next, they wrapped Hammond's body in a blanket and threw it in the trunk of his car. They took Shauna with them and drove to a nearby gas station. They bought a uh, gallon's worth of gas, drove to a deserted road. When we got there, Derek took the gasoline and pulled it on him. That's when um, he said, light it. So I was trying to light it, and he was running. He kept yelling, light the, light, light it, light. Derek said it was Jackie who poured the gasoline on the body and lit it, turning the car into an inferno. They ran back to the house to clean up the bloody evidence. Jackie had Thomas' wallet. When she opened it up, she seen the money that was in there. So when she pulled the money out, I seen the money, and she started counting it. Jackie tried to give me $400. I told Jackie I didn't want that money. Police found the car and the body the following morning and traced the license plate to Thomas Hammond. They went to his house and found Jackie asleep. According to Jackie, Derek was there as well. They also found blood throughout the house along with other evidence. Detectives brought Jackie and Derek to police headquarters and questioned them separately. Jackie had told me as we were sitting on the back porch that she had stabbed him with the scissors in the throat and that the whole thing had just gotten out of hand and she had to do what she did. After a day of interrogation by police, Jackie confessed to her part in the killing, but blamed Derek for Hammond's death. When he said the death penalty, I wanted to talk to my lawyers and tell them the confession was not true and it was too late. 
When Women Behind Bars continues. I am very, very sorry for what I've done. The part that I played in that, uh, in murdering Thomas. And later. Briefly, the evidence was that he was mauled to death by two pit bulls in his home while his parents were also in the home. It was a situation where someone needs to be held accountable for what happened to this child. On June 14, 1998, 36-year-old Jackie Alexander, along with her son's friend, 16-year-old Derek Wilkes, was charged with the gruesome murder of Jackie's roommate, Thomas Hammett. At Jackie's trial, Derek was the prosecution's key witness. He told the jury she was the killer. It was presented to me as if just get on stand and tell what happened. They didn't never make it seem as if we need your testimony against her. He was considerably younger than Jackie, and it was our view that Jackie, uh, to a great extent, manipulated him based upon their relative age differential. Meanwhile, Jackie's trial was still underway. In her defense, Jackie's attorney, Larry Harris, presented several reports by psychiatrists who examined her. They said abuse haunted her past. Their findings were that Ms. Alexander did, in fact, have a, a post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, among uh, other things, including substance abuse of um, cocaine, marijuana, and alcohol that she had um, somehow developed this mechanism within her that if she were attacked physically, that she would retaliate uh, with the intent to kill. Their theory was that she snapped. At the moment, Thomas Hammond slammed her to the floor. But the jury did not buy that defense. After two weeks of testimony, Jackie was found guilty of murder. When the verdict was announced, Jackie screamed in the courtroom. Then Jackie heard her daughter crying. I just wanted to go grab her and just tell her how sorry I was. In less than two hours, the jury rejected the death sentence and decided Jackie would spend the rest of her life in prison without the possibility of parole. They need to let us have her so we can do heal her the same way she did him. But you know, that'd have been wrong. Evil for evil, you can't do evil for evil. He cared enough for her. And then you gonna uh, kill him like that. You don't do a dog like that. Jackie now lives in a nine by six foot cell at the Southern Correctional Institution in Troy, North Carolina. On the walls are photos of her family. That's my grandbabies and me, Twink, my daughter, my grandfather. Also among the photos are some of her fiance, James, who she met through a church group. She says she and her fiance hope to marry if she is ever set free. We trust in God that I will. And um, we're looking for a, a better hope. At age 48, Jackie is working towards an associate's degree in office systems technology. These are my books, my dictionary, Purpose Driven Life, the journal, and my Bibles. I coach volleyball, basketball, kickball, softball teams. Uh, I'm in the Women's Service Club. I, uh, I'm on the board. I'm the membership director. Because of her good behavior, she merited the highest paying job in the prison, washing inmate laundry at $1 a day. The other jobs pay 40 cents. You have to wait in line for it. It don't just come to you. Jackie is one of the oldest inmates in her cell block. Many of the younger ones come to her for advice. They call this my little office. Everyone comes in here to talk to me in my office. We pray a lot in here. To be honest with you, she's suffering. She really is, because she's missing out on everything. So in our lives, she missed the birth of her grandkids, first grandkids, and I think she's learning her lesson. Jackie said she wrote a letter to the Hammond family, asking for them to forgive her. I am very sorry for what I've done. The part that I played in that, uh, in murdering Thomas. As far as I'm concerned, I forgive her. Because, like I said, if, uh, 
I die tonight, I don't need nothing preventing me from going to heaven. And you got to forgive and you got to care and you got to love people in order to, to go to heaven when you do die. I'm not even mad at Jackie no more. But what I would say to Jackie now, I want to know, I mean, why me? Why even want to involve me? I forgave him, pretty much know that he was fighting for his life. When I look back on the Jackie that was, I can't blame nobody for not loving a person like that. Um, because I wouldn't want to help a person like how I was. But now I don't like to see people hurt people. I don't like them picking on people who are less fortunate. Those, these are all these things of what I used to do. All these things of what I used to do. I'm happy for the first time in my life. I mean, I, I'm happy, you know. Um, I'm free on the inside. Next up on Women Behind Bars, a toddler dies when he wanders into a room with the family pit bulls. For more information about Women Behind Bars, go to www.wetv.com. On October 3rd, 2005, two and a half year old Jonathan Martin was mauled to death in his home in Suffolk, Virginia. Words cannot describe the, um, the mutilation of this child. Although the killer was an abused pit bull, the toddler's parents, James Martin and Heather Frango, were at home at the time of their child's gruesome death. Jonathan had over 100 bite marks on his body. His scalp had been ripped off, and his ears had been ripped off. It was just horrible, absolutely horrible. Was Heather Frango a negligent mother, or was she unfairly blamed for an unforeseeable accident? Heather Frango was born the only child of Sandra and Stephen Grenells. Heather's cousin, Alice Connor, remembers their childhood together. She had spent a lot of time at my house. She could be very funny, um, very outgoing, very generous at times, um, wanting to please. Other relatives describe Heather as a drama queen who always exaggerated a situation for her own benefit. But according to her cousin Alice, Heather just wanted to be loved. I think she felt lonely and left out sometimes. Heather's loneliness may have stemmed from a turbulent family life. Relatives say her mother was separated from her father a month before she was born. Heather had a hard time with uh, growing up. In her early teens, Heather met James Martin, a construction worker who lived in the Chesapeake area. He was four years older than her. He used to go crabbing, have fun, go out to water parks. Although James maintained a close friendship with Heather, at 20, she decided to marry James Frango, a furniture delivery driver. But a year later, they separated. Her mom wouldn't let her stay with her. Heather didn't have nowhere to go, so she ended up moving in with me. They lived together for two years when James was fined for keeping several pit bulls without a city license or proper vaccinations. I grew up with pit bulls my whole life. We always had pit bulls around our house, four or five dogs around our house. Despite his brush with the law, James continued to raise several different pit bulls as pets. And in the summer of 2002, Heather became pregnant. She was talking about whether or not she should have an abortion. I told her, you have an abortion, pack your stuff and leave now. I was worried when Heather got pregnant, to be honest. I wasn't sure she was ready to be a mother. There was information that she might have suffered from some uh, mental disorder. She told me that she was bipolar. Heather was 23 when her son Jonathan was born on January 4th, 2003. I went there to the hospital and he's beautiful. Soon after, Heather delivered another son named Daniel Connor. She continued to live with James Martin, who supported her and their children on his pay as a construction worker. James Martin was working as a framer, earning at least $18 an hour. 
Heather Frango did not work. Uh, she relied on James Martin for her support. I think that's the way she wanted it, from family and friends. We heard stories that she was not necessarily the best mother. Police said both Heather and James were also known to smoke pot on a daily basis. He supposedly was using a lot of the money that he made to buy drugs. He grew marijuana, he sold marijuana. In the winter of 2004, Heather, James, and their two sons moved into a home off a busy highway in Suffolk, Virginia. Once a passerby drove past the house and saw little Jonathan uh, out by the road, and no parent was in sight. She definitely was not watching that child. According to relatives, James and Heather often argued over the children. Sometimes the arguments would even turn physical. They would hit each other in front of the children. I didn't beat her. She would get very mad and want to try and fight me. And I would restrain her to keep from fighting. The couple often fought over James's pit bulls named Ox and Little Girl, whom he had chained in the backyard. Heather had indicated that uh, she was frightened of those dogs, and she was so afraid of them, she didn't want to go out back to hang up laundry. And in fact, one of them had, at one point, um, bit Jonathan. There was no marks or anything. So I figured you just nipped him or something. Not a, a big deal at that point to me. The Suffolk Police Department compiled information showing that the dogs had a history of growling at people. They had a history of biting individuals. A neighbor had been bitten by ox, the male pit bull. Both parents were informed of that. James said sometimes the children would play with the dogs. There were some allegations that James Martin had these dogs to protect his marijuana. He was growing marijuana in a field in the back of his house. They try to say that I had dogs to protect the marijuana crop. That's crazy. Sandra Connor, the mother of uh, Heather Frango, did tell uh, me that she, along with Heather, her daughter, had uh, told James to get rid of those dogs numerous times because uh, Heather hated the dogs. In August 2004, Alice Connor became concerned that the continual mistreatment of James's dogs could have serious consequences for the children so she visited her cousin, Heather. Alice noticed that the dogs were chained in the backyard in the blazing sun. They were tied to the tree, uh, chained with uh, no water in the bowl, and the food was just out of reach in his truck bed. They did have it, but they couldn't reach it, and the collars were embedded in the neck. Tethering for long periods of time is, is a bad thing for an animal and a bad thing for the family. There is sort of an urban myth out there that the pit bull, just by nature, is an, an innately aggressive dog towards humans and other animals. If you have people breeding them for illegal activity, then obviously they are going to focus on those behaviors and those tendencies that would be the, exactly the opposite of what we'd want in a pet. One year later, on the eve of October 2nd, 2005, James Martin and Heather Frango tucked their kids into bed upstairs. James brought the pit bulls into the house and allowed them to sleep in a room off the kitchen downstairs. Put the kids to bed, I fed the dogs, I put my male in a blocked off room with the female because there was a litter of puppies, and I put him in the cage. Heather and James then smoked marijuana in their bedroom and went to sleep. At 6.30 the following morning, according to Heather, both sons climbed into bed with the couple as they usually did. The younger son, Daniel, slept beside James, while the older one, Jonathan, was next to Heather. About an hour later, Jonathan told his mother he had to go to the bathroom, which was located downstairs. He got out of bed and wandered down the steps. I heard like a loud thump. Rolled over, my younger son was up under me, but Jonathan wasn't in the bed. So I woke Heather up, told her to go check on Jonathan. I'll be up in a second. So she went downstairs, the next thing I heard, she was screaming. Heather called 911. 
I go downstairs, she's in the living room floor just screaming. I start looking for Jonathan. I find him in the room where the dogs were, and I picked him up. And he was still responding to me, and I said, it's Daddy Jonathan. When Women Behind Bars continues. He was screaming at the top of his lungs, and the two people he was most likely screaming for were his mommy and his daddy, and they were nowhere to be found. On a crisp October night in 2005, James Martin had allowed his two pit bulls and litter of puppies to sleep in the house that he shared with Heather Frango and their two children. The next morning, their two and a half year old son, Jonathan, wandered downstairs alone to go to the bathroom and get a bowl of cereal, when the unthinkable happened. The pit bulls savagely attacked little Jonathan. His ears were removed. His scalp was removed. He had over 100 bite marks to his body. Detective John Jones was called to investigate the attack after police received a frantic 911 call from Heather Frango. She was saying something to the, about her dog attacking her son and that she was going to kill the dog. By the time Jones got to the house, an ambulance had already taken the severely bleeding child to a nearby helicopter. He was flown to a local hospital where his parents met with doctors. Jonathan was pronounced dead shortly after he arrived at the hospital. The cause of death was excessive internal bleeding. I walked out when I saw a curb, trying not to lose my head. Temporary custody of James and Heather's younger son, 20-month-old Daniel Connor, was given to Heather's aunt and uncle. While the couple mourned their son Jonathan's death, detectives began their investigation into murder charges against the parents. He was mauled to death by two pit bulls in his home while his parents were also in the home. It was a situation where someone needs to be held accountable. We had to prove child neglect in this case, which is very difficult to do. Detective Jones began his investigation by thoroughly looking over the house where the attack took place. He noticed one of the puppies in the litter was dead. He wondered if it was sick or if it had been killed in the attack. He also saw there were homemade ineffective child protection barriers in a home that was uninhabitable for children. The house had rats, was unsanitary, and dangerous. After Jonathan's death, the city condemned it. There was a small uh, board that they were using as a uh, baby gate, a barrier between the kitchen and this room where the attack occurred. And it was, uh, according to James, Jonathan had been known to climb over it, so it really wasn't serving any purpose. But there was blood um, up and down, all the way to the top of this board and across the board, and including the walls that were adjacent to this board. To me, as an investigator, it appeared as though that this boy was literally, at one point, probably in the jaws of this pit bull, and this dog was slinging this boy all over this room. A bite expert who examined both dogs and Jonathan's body found the male dog, Ox, was probably the dog who caused the boy's death. In order to have a strong case, investigators needed to prove that the owners were aware that the pit bulls had a history of being aggressive. The Suffolk Police Department began their investigation by interviewing neighbors, by interviewing the family members, and they compiled information showing that the dogs had a history of growling at people. They had a history of biting individuals. A neighbor had been bitten by ox, the male pit bull. Both parents were informed of that. But investigators could only speculate as to what set off the pit bulls leading to their attack on Jonathan. Were they hungry when they saw Jonathan with a bowl of cereal? Or as James Martin believes, were the dogs protecting one of their own? There was one puppy missing from the litter. I think my son went down there, played with a puppy. I imagine the puppy yelped, and the dog had attacked him out of protection over the puppies. Two months after Jonathan's death, police arrested James Martin and Heather Frango. They were charged with second-degree murder, involuntary manslaughter, and child neglect. Heather says she felt, and still feels, anger, hurt, and disappointment towards James and herself. 
Their case was the first in the country in which parents were charged with murder in connection with a family dog attack. James was also charged with drug possession since he had marijuana on him when police picked him up. One of the most remarkable things that stood out to me when I read the autopsy report was that this child's throat and larynx were still intact, which indicated that he was screaming at the top of his lungs. And the two people he was most likely screaming for were his mommy and his daddy. And they were nowhere to be found. What was still a mystery to investigators was how neither parent came to Jonathan's rescue. But while awaiting trial in jail, Heather and her boyfriend confessed to some inmates as to why they did not hear their son. The information we had from the two inmates was that they were smoking marijuana at the time the attack occurred. They had shut the door and were taking hits off of the bomb. We had nothing to do with this happening. Nothing. On May 15, 2006, seven months after little Jonathan's death, Heather and James pled guilty to child neglect and involuntary manslaughter. In exchange, the state dropped the second-degree murder charge against them. They faced 20 years in prison. On August 28th, Heather and James were sentenced to only three years in prison, with James getting an additional six months for a previous hit-and-run crash. Heather now says she believes God has a purpose for her, but at the time of the sentencing, she was distraught. He had a friend go after she was sentenced. She was running down the hallways, screaming. Their sentences caused an outcry by the public. Newspaper columnist Tamara Dietrich wrote about the case. They faced originally 60 years, and then when they uh, pleaded out, they faced 20, and they were given three. Um, and even at that time, family members of Franco and Martin thought that was unfair. There were many people in the community, myself included, who thought that was hardly enough. Nothing they can do to me is going to even touch. That burden of my son's death ain't never going away. Alice Connor believes the best gift she could leave in memory of Jonathan is this public service announcement. It was sponsored by the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, on the mistreatment of dogs. Chain dogs are three times more likely to attack people because they don't get the companionship and exercise they need and crave. Heather is incarcerated at the Fuvana Women's Correctional Center near Charlottesville, Virginia. She is currently scheduled to get out a month before James in June 2009. She says she will always love James, but most of all, Heather says she misses Jonathan every second of every day and thinks the point of her life has diminished. Today, James Martin is at the Lunenburg Correctional Center in Victoria, Virginia. He feels he can never forgive himself for his son's death and commemorates him with a tattoo over his heart and one on his arm. Picture of my son, close to my heart. Two hearts, me and Heather, with our son's names on our hearts. We're all locked together through time. Their younger son, Daniel Connor, remains in the custody of Heather's aunt and uncle. Both parents phone him, and in March 2008, Heather's aunt took him to see Heather in prison. Where he's living at is in good environment and taken care of. James is scheduled to leave prison in July 2009. I have all plans of us being married. There won't be no more animals in my house or on my property. None. I don't want none. But I don't think so much she would want kids after this. We both feel that way.